And BTN Live rolls on. We continue our preview of the upcoming Final Four this weekend. Let's bring in Nicole Auerbach now, the college basketball writer for USA Today and BTN contributor. Uh, Nicole, in the last segment, we mentioned the statement that the coaches released about the Indiana Religious Freedom Act. How much will this be a storyline this coming weekend? So I think I think it's going to be a huge storyline. I think it already has been. Um, I mean, when, you, when the Indy Star goes front page editorial on an issue, um, I, I think that automatically drew a ton of eyeballs to this. And you've had so many different uh, figures in the sports world speak out already. I mean, even tangentially, Pat Hayden, uh, USC's AD, saying that he's you know the proud father of a gay son and he's not coming for college football playoff meetings, and that got a ton of attention. That got headlines. So then you know you have coaches coming out. Um, you know, I think they're trying to put out that statement because they know they're going to get a lot of questions about this. Tomorrow is when media availabilities begin. It's going to be a thing that players are going to be asked about, coaches are going to be asked about, I think daily, um, because it's such a hot topic right now and very controversial. I think last night with UConn's announcement that its coaching staff, including the national defend, defending national champion coach, Kevin Ollie, not coming to Indianapolis because they're going to follow there's a Connecticut ban on state employees traveling to Indiana right now. And I think all of that is just, it's just feeding this frenzy and it's just going to continue to grow and grow. Um, and my coworkers and I are, you know, going to be talking to fans around here about what they think about things. Um, you know, I'm, one thing I've always been kind of curious, we'll never know the answer, but hypothetically, if this had happened four months ago, could the NCAA have moved to the final four? And, hmm. I, and I wonder, we'll never know the answer to that, but you know, I almost think that there's so much outrage that had this that happened four months ago that that might be a real possibility. So, so I think it's going to be a huge storyline. It's going to dominate coverage. I, I do think for the next week. Let's turn our attention on the court, but stay with the concept of storylines. What's the better storyline: Kentucky going undefeated or someone beating Kentucky? You know, I think it's really compelling to watch a team go for history. I mean, there's a reason that no one's done this since 1976, and, and I think that the team itself is really interesting. I mean, there's a lot of kind of goofballs, and tell, like Willie Cauley-Stein is a really insightful, intelligent guy. Carl Towns is like the biggest heart of anyone, and there's really interesting people on this team and players that, you know, we haven't really gotten to know and kind of lump all together as like, ah, oh, Kentucky, this monster, and like they're going to beat everyone by a zillion points, and it's just like this machine, but it's not, and there's veterans, and there's freshmen, and there's Harrison twin to obviously Aaron and the big shots last year. There's so many different layers to this team. And I've been fascinated by the psychological angle of how the heck did you take potentially 10 pros, put them on the same team and say that, and say that, um, that if, you know, they are average 26 points a game and, uh, only, you know, in the leading score is 11 points a game. I mean, it's going to work. So I'm, I'm very compelled by. By Kentucky and and this quest for perfection, I think the reason everyone tunes in and there's record ratings is because everyone wants to see if they can be beaten. All right, on to the other game. Talk to me about Duke's offense. They're averaging 79 points a game. What do you find most impressive about them? Uh, I think you know I like Duke's offense. I liked it all year. What, what's interesting to me is Quinn Cook. Um, there's been so much attention on on the freshmen and. Especially Justice Winslow has just been playing fantastic, and he's kind of done that all year. He's kind of a glue guy; he'll dive and um, and do a bunch of things. And I, 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 but I like Quinn Cook. He's lone senior on the team. You could kind of see at the end of the game where he was so emotional with Coach K because he was the guy who had been on a bunch of teams that lost in the first round. He was on the but he lost to Lehigh. He lost to Mercer. He had never gotten to hang a banner, and they only hang banners for really great things at Duke. So I think. He has been kind of a catalyst and, and kind of an underrated one because he often hit, you know, a shot that made that stopped a run for the other team, and then maybe Tyus Jones would then hit three threes, you know, and so Tyus would get you know the headlines. And I think that Quinn Cook was always kind of the he could balance things out, and he would, um, you know, he just kind of like I said, stopped the bleeding, kick started them when they needed to be, and he's kind of been that veteran presence on a team that may have one may may have more one and done players. Than Kentucky does, which hmm. is hard to imagine, but they are led by these three incredible freshmen. That is true. Very people remember they they both got nine McDonald's All Americans on their rosters. Go go back to the beginning of the year, Nicole. If if I was to tell you, tell you back in November, two things. You tell me which is more improbable. One that Michigan State, after all they lost and the tough start to the year they had, would make it to the Final Four, or two that Travis Trice, a guy who only averaged seven points a game last year, would be scoring nineteen per contest in the NCAA tournament. I 
think I'd be more surprised as a team in general after Texas Southern. Um, and I know Texas Southern made the tournament, but an overtime loss at home to a team like that, I mean, I don't think anyone's thinking of Final Four at that time. But Trice, you know, is interesting because we've sort of seen that happen before. I mean, Frank Kaminsky was kind of a no-name, you know, didn't contribute much kind of player. Now he's emerged and obviously, you know, probably going to win a bunch of National Player of the Year awards. And obviously that was over a span of a couple of years. But I just think that, you know, the tournament, anything can happen. Um, Michigan State of all teams knows that with Shabazz Napier kind of going off on them last year and Boatwright. So I think, I don't think Trice would be the likely pick for any of that, but I think it's more surprising in general after the ups and downs that Michigan State had and how, I mean, they were in a zillion overtime games and, and they never looked dominant. And I thought, you know, the Big Ten I thought was up and down all year outside of Wisconsin. And just to see the way that they – have gotten so hot and, and sustained such a high level, including Trice, including Dawson, um, including Valentine. It's just it's just been really impressive, and I, and I, I didn't predict it. I don't think anyone did. I think if you saw him play in the Big Ten tournament, you had an inkling they were capable of it, but. Uh, you know, I mean, if you said that in December, I would have looked at you like you were crazy. <laughs> you gave me that look a lot this fall, regardless. <laughs> Before we let you go, Nicole, the Big Ten team most likely to win on Saturday is? You know, I'm going to go Michigan State. Wow. I think they've got one more in them, um, and I don't really see Kentucky losing. You know, I saw them all last weekend in Syracuse. You know, I know how well Tom is can coach against other great coaches, and uh, I will take part in you're the first person I've heard give that answer. Nicole Auerbeck, thanks so much for the insight. Enjoy the weekend in Indy. All right. Thanks for having me.